what it is. It's a, um, a, a, a university, a senator-approved um, um, center um, comprising about 35 um, clinicians and, and, and uh, basic science investigators. This was created um, in 2002. One of our founding members and first director, Ross McGovery, Wave Ross, yes, okay, they created this center um, really in response to the um, um, HIV and hepatitis um, um, uh, infection of, or an invasion essentially of the, of the blood um, 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 sources um, in our Canadian, well, it was the Canadian Red Cross initially and then became the Canadian Blood Services. But as part of, of that whole process, there was an investigation and the Canadian Blood Service was uh, spun out as our sole mode of collection and distribution of blood in Canada, except Quebec, which is always a, a little different, um, and um, but money came avail became available, and uh, some uh, um, future thinking, uh, forward thinking investigators um, got together and formed this virtual center that is truly multidisciplinary and multi faculty. And this had really this was early days. Uh, this wasn't a common uh, sort of theme of having multidisciplinarity and multi faculty involvement. Uh, of a variety. So we had engineers, and we had uh, there. I wasn't there. There were engineers and basic scientists from faculty of science, faculty of medicine, faculty of arts, faculty of pharmacology. Um, uh, you name it, and they were involved. And this collection of um, physicians and scientists got together to form this center. And it's roughly split into themes of of inflammation, infection, um, uh, blood. Uh, transfusion-oriented work, and then he hemostasis, thrombosis. Those are the general themes. But there's a lot of hybrid um, interactions. And as a consequence with that, we've developed this, I think, very, very strong program with lots of interactions um, and um, spread over our wings. And it's really um, done everybody a lot of, of, brought a lot of value to the trainees, to education, and everything else. So that's where we are now. Um, when I arrived in 2009 and I was appointed, anointed, the uh, director position of the Center for Blood Research, I was introduced to two um, clinicians, uh, one being Sheldon Neiman, who was a, um, a hematologist, a senior hematologist. He was nearing retirement at that stage, but he'd come from Toronto. Funny story there, but I'll tell you over drinks. Um, but he, um, um, was, um, he, he was really the first... Um, uh, he, he trained in Toronto, then went to L.A., and came to Vancouver, and he established the first hematology transplant, bone marrow transplant program. He was the first head of hematology um, in those days, and a leading uh, educator and trainer of pretty well everybody. Um, Linda Vickers came along a little later as a, a hematology trainee. Um, they met. That doesn't happen anymore, does it? Um, and <laughs> and uh, they became a famous uh, couple. Linda Vickers is, was a hematologist of a great um, talents, and uh, she really established the hemophilia program for adults um, for Vancouver. And just remember, that means all of British Columbia. And together, they were a, 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 an incredible force here. Um, so they were on my steering committee because they were really interested in establishing links between the basic sciences and the clinic um, and supporting uh, mentorship and training and education programs. Sadly, uh, Linda died um, fairly early. Um, and um, Shelley died a couple, two, three years later. Um, but they left a very large endowment to the center um, to carry on their um, wishes, which we actively do uh, work hard towards. And it's supported, as I said, travel awards for many of you here. Um, the uh, new hematology fellowship program um, um, established by Shannon and Haley, and also a named professorship um, in um, what we, I, I thought I changed that slide, I guess I didn't, in ben, what I call a um, visiting professor in benign hematology, but I've been, I was corrected last night, and we're going to call it non-malignant hematology, because as Linda pointed out many times, a patient, a hemophilia patient who is bleeding, that is not benign. It may be non-malignant, but it's certainly not benign. So I have the pleasure of introducing um, Dr. Elizabeth, or Beth Batnelli, um, 
who hails from Boston, um, which is near and dear to my heart because I loved my training years um, in Boston. Um, and as the, uh, this year's uh, Linda Vickers and, or Sheldon Neyman and Linda Vickers uh, visiting professor. Um, and um, Beth um, is an associate professor at the Brigham and Women's um, Hospital at Harvard Medical School. She um, tr did her uh, undergraduate degree at Harvard University, a master's at Oxford University. That's Then she came back to Boston, and she sort of bounced around because everything was very close, so she worked at BU, um, did her some training there, her MD, MD, am I right? MD, PhD, and then came to um, Longwood, um, I would call it, and um, worked at um, um, uh, at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, she's really an expert in uh, platelet biology, that's her area of expertise, um, but she has many, many other um, um, interests. Um, and she not only is a great scientist, but really gives back in spades, an active member of all the international committees, including the ASH co-chair for educational meetings and a member of the Committee for Scientific Affairs. Um, and she comes highly praised. I don't often go to the rate a doctor sites, but here I did because it's really important to know that I'm, we're in giving this to somebody who really values patient care. And there's no question about it. She is highly touted by her patients as well as by her trainees. So I'm delighted to invite Beth up here to give a presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say that that's the first person who's actually looked at my docs imagery ratings before. Um, and I hope that wasn't all my family members. <laughs> um, but in doing that, I'll just say that it is a real honor um, to be here today and to, and to be, uh, yeah, go ahead. And to be asked to give uh, this uh, lecture in the, in the name of uh, Linda and Shelley. And I uh, really think that it is the spirit of what we've seen here today actually would make them very proud. You know, this meeting today is not just about science or, or you know, clinical research. There's also patients who are included. And uh, something that I thought was just really very much awe-inspiring was the parade of the future that we saw here when we had the young trainees who just came up here and let us know about their research. And anyone who's worried about their future I, and the future of, of our world, I think you can all just take pause and say it's good because we just saw uh, some amazing uh, trainees come up here and tell us about their accomplishments and what they hope to accomplish in the future. So um, with that, I'd like to now turn over to my talk. And I think we're going to just take a little bit of a, a break from thinking about uh, thrombosis and hemostasis, and I hope that you will all bear with me when I try to convince you that platelets do other things than stop you from bleeding. Uh, and we're going to talk about the role that platelets play in malignancy. So I have nothing to disclose today. So I always like to start with this patient um, because it was, for me, the first time I really started to think about this, and this was during my first year of my fellowship in Hemonc. Um, and I also, I, I'm kind of a bit of a nerd, and so along with my patient, I also have going to share with you my favorite scientific theory. Uh, so we have uh, this patient who presented to us in a clinic with stage three breast cancer. She was to undergo systemic chemotherapy and radiation, and I noted that at the time that she first came in to see me, that her platelet count was a little bit higher than I would expect at 560. By April, she had developed a deep vein thrombosis and a pulmonary embolism. Uh, she was started on anticoagulation, but I noted that her platelet count was rising. And um, by September, her platelet count was very high, and her scans showed that she was not responding to the, to the therapies and that her disease was taking the turn for, uh, for worse. Um, so not only does this show you that there could be a link between platelets and cancer, but also this patient uh, developed a DVT and a PE, and we've heard a lot about thrombosis today, especially uh, Dr. Zwicker started us off this morning with a talk on cancer and thrombosis. And this triad is really where I live every day of my life. I think about platelets, but I also think about uh, changes in uh, the blood flow, and I think about the hypercoagulability. And I see patients in clinic who have disorders of platelets, but also disorders in hypercoagulability um, and the role that the endothelium may play in all that. So today, though, we are going to focus on platelets. And um, I think that 
we're going to talk about the fact that, yes, we know platelets are important in thrombosis and atherogenesis, but recently they've also been shown to play a role in immune immunity, such as autoimmune disease, things like acute lung injury and liver disease, uh, sepsis, COVID, I think we all saw that there was a role for platelets in COVID, and cardiac things as we would expect, but also in malignancy. And what data do we have to kind of support that the role that platelets play in malignancy? Well, this is actually work from GASIC way back when. Uh, and, and this is an, a mouse model where what was done was that they injected, they injected tumor cells into the tail vein of the mouse. And when you do that, they, they kind of set up shop in different metastatic sites. And one of the first sites that they'll go to is actually the lungs. And so what they did was they looked in the lungs of these animals after they had been injected with the, with the tumor cells to see, OK, where did they go and, and what, how many metastases did they see? But at the same time, they took these same mice and they gave them ITP, or they lowered their platelet count by immune uh, methods. And they noticed that when the platelet count was very low, as I think you can see here, yes, good, there were less metastatic sites of disease, and that as the platelet count recovered from the immune therapies, there were more and more metastatic sites. Now, we can't really do this in our patients. We can't cause them to be thrombocytopenic um, because we would worry about them. But we do have kind of the reciprocal data in patients. And this is demonstrating that patients who present at the time of diagnosis with malignancy, all solid tumor malignancies across the board, those patients who present with a thrombocytosis or an elevated platelet count actually have a worse prognosis, this is overall survival, in comparison to the blue line, which is patients who present with a normal platelet count. So this is a kind of, a, of the first kind of animal as well as patient data demonstrating that there's a link between platelets and cancer. Um, and this is from a study uh, that looked at a number of different solid tumor malignancies, ovarian, lung, mesothelioma, breast, uh, demonstrating that those that had a higher platelet count, so thrombocytosis, actually had a worse outcome. And it's very interesting to me that it's across the board all different types of solid tumor malignancies. There's also now data demonstrating something called a platelet to lymphocyte ratio that can be used uh, to predict outcome in patients with malignancy. And here, those who have a high platelet to lymphocyte ratio have a uh, lower survival rate for disease-free survival as well as for overall survival. <coughs> So over the years, uh, my lab, as well as a number of other labs, have demonstrated that platelets are actually important for every step of the metastatic cascade. And here on the right, I'm showing you some images of tumor cells here in red with platelets here in green. And I hope you see that the platelets are kind of attracted to the tumor cell. Um, and, and here, this is a schematic demonstrating all the steps in metastasis. And from the very beginning, from primary tumor growth, we believe that platelets actually may have a role as bringing in angiogenic factors to help with tumor growth. They actually can help with the tumor cell intravasation into, across the endothelium and into the blood vessel. In circulation, the tumor cells, the CTCs, or circulating tumor cells, actually get covered, as you can see in my images here, with platelets. And, and I refer to this as the Harry Potter of invisibility cloak. Because now those tumor cells can actually travel through circulation, and they're not going to be recognized by the natural killer cells, because the platelets are covering them. And so that kind of allows them to escape in circulation. And then again, on the other end, when we're talking about now setting up shop in our metastatic site, you can see that they're very important here for actually helping with a platelet to help the, the tumor cells to arrest and then to extravasate out of the circulation now into its new site where it's going to set up metastasis. And my lab really has projects looking at every single step on this stage. We're not going to talk about all of them today. I'll be highlighting two of the newer projects. But I'll, I'll just use this as a schematic to show you that platelets are important for invasion. They're important in circulation, as we have just talked, for helping to uh, escape the immunosurveillance. Extravasation, where they enable the tumor cells to arrest and, um, and block microvasculature. And then again, in colonization. Let's start by talking a little bit about the invasive properties of cancer cells that are driven by platelets. Um, and I think the best way to illustrate this is actually to just show you these films. Let's see, can we all get them all going here? Yes? Great. 
So I hope, let's go through this. So the first set, the first panel is just tumor cells that are in DMEM or just tissue culture media. You see a little bit of movement. These here are tumor cells, same tumor cells, but this time they are incubated with platelets. And here they're incubated with platelet-rich plasma. And I hope you can see that over time there are more tumor cells that are invading if they are incubated together with platelets or with the platelet-rich plasma in comparison to the DMEM. We know that there's a number of ways that platelets can do this, but one of the key factors that's important to understand about how platelets have a role in cancer is to, to look, think a little bit about, uh, about their structure. And platelets have in them many different types of granules. The powerhouse of the platelet is actually the alpha granule. There's about 40 to 80 alpha granules per platelet, and those store a number of different factors, like VEGF and P-selectin, P PDGF, uh, and you know, in addition to your coagulation factors and other chemokines. And early work in, in our lab with, uh, with Dr. Joe Italiano demonstrated that actually the packaging in these alpha granules is not so straightforward. And if you were to actually pluck out two alpha granules and try to look in the content, they would actually not be the same. And so you have differential packaging, but also differential release of these alpha granules from platelets. And I won't, in the interest of time, I really won't be getting into that, but we did a series of, of experiments where we took tumor cells, shown here in these orange cells, and uh, just incubated them with platelets, and then collected this, what we call activated platelet release and then used that activated platelet release set on standard assays for metastasis, namely invasion, transendothelial migration, and capillary tube formation, and demonstrated that those platelets that were, uh, the, the platelet-rich plasma that, that had been incubated with the tumor cells actually made this activated release set that could drive invasion, migration, and capillary tube formation more in comparison to just the resting, activated, resting platelets. And if we were to look at what was in that activated platelet release state, surprisingly, we didn't see the, the, the cancer uh, molecules that we were expecting, but instead what we saw was a lot of inflammatory markers. And we saw things like CCL5 or RANTES, we saw EGF, um, PDGF, but uh, the number one factor that was actually up in that activated platelet release state in, that was made from platelets that were incubated with tumor cells was actually CCL5. Um, now we know that this idea that platelets actually could be important in uh, malignancy does not just relate to solid tumors, but could also relate to what we consider liquid tumors. And here, this is myeloma, which is kind of you know in the middle, uh, with some some sense that it may be a solid tumor, and then others that are involved in bone marrow aspects. But here, what this was work with Dr. Irene Gobriel, and what we did was we actually took those tumor cells, and we again incubated them with platelets. And then we injected those tumor cells either without platelet incubation or with the platelet incubation. And those that were pre-cultured, those mice actually had more metastatic sites of disease. And if we did the old GASIC experiment that I told you, where we actually uh, made the mice thrombocytopenic, this time with a CD41 antibody, and then put the tumor cells in, you can see that those that had the low platelet counts actually had less sites of metastasis in comparison to the mice that had a normal platelet count. So going back to this idea that CCL5 may be important for part of the metastatic potential of, uh, of the platelet in, in cancer, we asked, well, if we know that the platelets in response to the tumor cells, here's your tumor cell and here's your platelets, is releasing CCL5, what is that doing to the tumor cell? And the tumor cells that we were using have a CCR5 receptor. That's the receptor for CCL5 present on that. And if we were to uh, block that CCR5 receptor with Maraviraq, which is a drug that blocks the receptor, we actually saw that we saw much less invasion of those tumor cells. So again, the platelets are incubated with the tumor cells. We use uh, invasion assays, and we saw much less if we just added Maraviraq in. And that also begged the question for us, well, what's going on in that tumor cell? So what is this signaling from CCL5 to CCR5 doing inside the tumor cell? And so we looked at what happens in, uh, to the tumor cells and demonstrated that actually the incubation of platelets with the tumor cells, if you then took those tumor cells, washed away all the platelets, and look to see what pathways were up in those tumor cells, IL-8 was one of the pathways that was up. 
Now, the cells that we are using here are all breast cancer cells, and IL-8 has been shown to be very important in uh, the invasive capacity of breast cancer cells. So of course, now that we know that uh, we are able to know some of the molecular players in this, namely platelets and tumor cells release CCL5, this works through the CCR5 receptor to then generate IL-8 in the tumor cells, and that this could be important for angiogenesis and metastasis, we started to think about ways that we could break this crosstalk, because ultimately, wouldn't that be the goal, right? If we could stop the platelets from supporting metastasis, then maybe then we could find another way or a new, uh, a new way of thinking about treating cancer. And so, you know, of course, the first thing we did was to think about antiplatelet agents. And the, the, uh, at the same time that I was in the lab, this was, I'd be dating myself if I said this, but a long time ago, uh, Rothwell came out with studies demonstrating that patients, this was published in The Lancet, patients who had been taking aspirin at the time of their diagnosis actually had a better outcome, had less metastasis, and they survived longer. Uh, and so, of course, then we thought, well, maybe that's what's happening, the, that aspirin could be breaking this crosstalk between platelets and tumor cells, therefore you get less CCL5, less CCR5 upregulation, and IL. L8 would be, you know, uh, would be, this whole pathway would be disrupted. And around the same time, Coppinger and colleagues demonstrated actually that plate aspirin did regulate what came, was released from platelets. So secretion in, from platelets in response to aspirin um, was, was, was moderated. And so for these reasons, we thought, wouldn't that be nice? We could just give patients aspirin. Um, and so we did a number of studies to demonstrate that actually in test tubes and in in vitro, you do see that you can disrupt this crosstalk. Uh, and here I'm just showing you that if you were to do those studies where you'd have the platelets and the tumor cells together, this is a breast cancer cell line, uh, that if the if the platelets were pre-treated with aspirin and then interacted with the tumor cells, you saw less CCL5 release and less IL-8 generation. With our collaborator, Dr. Sandy McAllister, we actually have a model of breast cancer tumor dormancy uh, where you actually have a, two different types of tumors uh, that, are, that are injected into the mouse and only in the presence of the instigator will this responder grow. And if you were to treat the animals, and, and in pa past studies we actually showed that there were platelets in those responding to tissue and there were more angiogenesis uh, markers such as VEGF and that there were more capillary tubes in those, those tumors that had the, the uh, platelets that were in the tissue. But if you treated those animals with aspirin, you actually didn't see any IL-8. And here, with no aspirin, you saw lots of IL-8 in the tissue, but without aspirin, you saw none. Now, since mice don't have any IL-8, all of this IL-8 came from the tumor cells that we were putting in. And there was no IL-8 or very little IL-8 and the mice that were treated with aspirin. So we thought, ah, there's some proof of concept of what we're seeing. We then went to our patients and said, well, can we find this kind of, this kind of crosstalk in our patients, and does aspirin make a difference? At that time, Dr. Wendy Chen at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute had started the ABC trial that was through DOD, where she was putting patients on aspirin for five years to see did that make an impact on their survival. Um, and we were able to get, it was hard to get breast cancer patient samples as, uh, as you know, in translational studies can be hard, but we were able to get uh, patients who had different stages of breast cancer. They were either on aspirin or not on aspirin. And uh, we were able to look in their serum. We were not able to do platelet studies, but we did look at their serum and demonstrated that those patients who were on aspirin had less soluble P-selectin. Now, I understand that the soluble P-selectin could also come from an endothelial source, so I say that you know, with a caveat that this was not a platelet study. But we were also able to demonstrate that in the serum of the patients with breast cancer who were taking aspirin, there was less IL-8 as well as less CCL5. And when we took the platelets from the patients who were on aspirin or not on aspirin, who had breast cancer, and then did uh, studies to look at invasion as well as the ability to generate IL-8, we were able to show that those patients who were taking an aspirin, the tumor cells no longer generated significant IL-8 in comparison to using the platelets for the same studies on tumor cells, but this time the patients were not on an aspirin. So we were very excited to think, well, maybe we are actually showing evidence in the lab of why taking an aspirin a day could actually be of benefit. 
but like most things in life, it's very complicated. Um, and now there's actually been data demonstrating in a number of studies that were not done for looking at not done looking at aspirin and cancer, they were done for other reasons, but demonstrating that taking an aspirin a day can actually increase your risk of death from cancer. So I would tell you that the story is still out on whether or not antiplatelet agents can actually be used as a modulator of the crosstalk between platelets and tumor cells. So let's move on now from invasion and let's now look into circulation. So this is when the tumor cell is actually uh, surviving in the vasculature and could be at risk by being removed from the, by the immune system. This is work by Chu Chen Guo and Mike Malloy, who are mem were members of my lab, but Chu Chen's now moved on to industry, and Mike is in a PhD program, I'm very pleased. Um, and Chu actually wanted to understand whether or not there, now that you know, she understood that there was a role for the, the tumor cells being, being removed from circulation by natural killer cells, she wondered if there was any connection between between platelets and the ability to upregulate PDL1. So PDL1, for those who don't spend their time in the, uh, the cancer world, um, is an immune checkpoint protein. And basically what happens here is then they, they work together to inhibit T cell uh, killing of tumor cells. And there are now a number of different drugs, which we're all familiar with, that block PD1 and PDL1. And when that happens, now the tumor cell can be exposed and is able to be uh, removed by the immune system. So uh, Chooch took two different types of cancer cells. She took breast cancer cells, which are here, as well as lung cancer cells. And what she did was she incubated the tumor cells with platelets and then looked by flow as well as by mRNA, and I'm showing you mRNA here, and demonstrated that those tumor cells that had seen platelets actually had increased levels of PDL1. And she saw that in breast as well as in lung cancer. So going back to our aspirin story, we wondered, well, what if a patient is taking aspirin? Would that impact the ability of platelets to upregulate PDL1? And here, so this is the same data that I'm showing here, but this is on flow. Here we have the tumor cells alone, tumor cells after exposure to platelets, again showing you the upregulation of PDL1 on the tumor cell surface. But now, if those platelets had been pretreated with aspirin or ticagrelor, prior to this incubation, you could see that there was a decrease in the ability of the platelet to upregulate PDL1. And we saw that in lung cancer cells as well. So we took a step back and thought, well, what could be going on in those tumor cells that is leading to this PDL1 upregulation? And we looked at the usual things when we, that we know can upregulate PDL1, like interferon gamma and things. And we weren't really able to find any of uh, the usual suspects uh, as implicated here in the platelet and tumor cell PDL1 story. But we went back to look at some of our data looking at what was in that release aid from activated platelets that had been incubated with tumor cells. And one of the other factors that was quite high was actually EGF. Uh, and EGF has been shown in other cells to upregulate PDL1. And so here what we did was we did the same thing. We incubated our tumor cells and our platelets, but we added into the mix anti-EGF and saw that you had a normalization of the ability of the platelet to upregulate PDL1. We then looked at whether or not the EGFR receptor on the surface of the tumor cells was phosphorylated in response to incubation with platelets and demonstrated, yes, there was a phosphorylation of that EGFR receptor. And if you use drugs like cetuximab that actually block the EGFR receptor and then incubate with platelets, you no longer get that upregulation in PDL1. So from here, which is just platelets, to here, which is adding cetuximab into the mix of the tumor cells with the platelets. Um, and then we used sRNA, and we just generated two different tumor cell lines, some that were, that were EGFR low and some that were EGFR high. And the tumor cell lines that were EGFR high were more likely to give you this pattern of having an upregulation of PDL1, shown here in red, when exposed to platelets as opposed to the tumor cells that had low EGFR on the surface. So this led to our idea that 
the, uh, the, the platelets were releasing EGF, and we actually think, I won't go into this, but we actually think that it is a pro-EGF that gets released and sits on the outside surface of the platelet, and that platelet tumor cell interaction is really important there, and that this upregulates the phosphorylation of EGFR receptor, leading to upregulation of PDL1. Now, of course, that's all nice, but what we needed to show that there was actually a functionality to this, and so the whole point of the PDL1, PD1 story is actually T cell cytotoxicity. And so we did uh, cytotoxicity toxicity efficacy assays and demonstrated that the, as we would expect, when PDL1 went up because of the platelets, you would see less cytotoxicity, just as we showed here. But if you added cetuximab and blocked the ability of the platelet to upregulate PDL1, you saw more cytotoxicity. So this to us was a nice proof of concept. Um, of course, now we need to show this in our uh, in, in patients, and we also need to think about this in terms of animal studies and whether or not adding in antiplatelet therapy or targeting the EGFR receptor could actually be added to standard of standard immune checkpoint therapies. So moving on to the next part of our story, we're going to actually go outside of our cascade. So here's our metastatic cascade. We've talked about invasion. We've talked about circulation. The next story I'd like to share with you is, um, is a work of a postdoc in my lab who is now an instructor, a Dr. Harvey Raweth. Uh, and he looked at whether or not megakaryocytes, which is the mother cell of the platelet, actually were changed by malignancy. So what Harvey wanted to ask was, well, if we know that there can be more platelets in the setting of malignancy, and we know that platelets are really important for the crosstalk between platelets and tumor cells, well, is the megakaryocyte changed in such a way that it kind of fuels the fire so that the platelets that are produced are maybe increased in number, but also maybe their character is changed so that maybe they contain more pro-tumor uh, compounds that can then make the platelets, uh, you know, more, uh, have more capacity for metastasis. And so there really was little known about the relationship between tumor cells and megakaryocytes. For these studies, we again turn to breast cancer, and there is a spontaneous metastasis model. It's called the PYMT model, and basically these mice, as they age, form lots of metastasis on their own. You don't really need to do anything. But by 13, 14 weeks, their tumor burden can be quite high, and so that's usually the humane endpoint for the, for the mice. What Harvey did was he isolated from the bone marrow the megakaryocytes from either controls, wild type, or the PYMT mice that had all of those metastatic sites of disease, and demonstrated that there really wasn't any difference uh, in the megakaryocytes themselves, but there was a skewing towards a higher ploidy, as shown here in red, in the megakaryocytes that came from the mice with the, that were the PYMT or the cancer-carrying uh, mice. We then did a series of proteomic studies as well as single cell RNA studies. And here, first, we'll look at the proteomic studies. We demonstrated that actually uh, in these mice in here, we were, what we did was we inoculated these mice with tumor cells. And then we looked at day 21. You could see lots of metastatic sites of disease. We again isolated the megakaryocytes and did proteomics on those megakaryocytes, demonstrating that a number, as we would expect, a number of cancer pathways were actually highlighted in those megakaryocytes from the mice that were tumor bearing. Um, and we looked at that, and surprisingly to us, Again, we saw inflammatory markers that were up, not necessarily cancer markers that were up. So in the proteomics data, we saw that S100A8 and 9 were up, lipocalin 2 was up, and cathepsin G. And so this is just some ELISAs demonstrating that what we saw in our proteomics uh, work was actually also in our uh, by, true by ELISA. Again, we did a similar experiment, but this time we did SIR, uh, uh, we did single cell RNA sequencing, looking at the megakaryocytes from the tumor-bearing animals. And uh, here there are different, uh, different populations of megakaryocytes, but again, using the single cell data, demonstrated again that there were inflammatory markers that were up in the megakaryocytes in the tumor-bearing mice. Thankfully for us, it did correlate with our proteomics data, and we saw uh, S100A8 and 9 was up in our RNA experiments, as well as and G. 
Of course, we wanted to demonstrate not only was this present in the megakaryocytes, but we also hoped that we would find that there would be up in the platelets. And here, these are platelets from wild type or the PYMT, um, tumor-bearing animals, demonstrating that S100A8 and 9 is up, as well as lipocalin. So this really took us from a tumor-bearing model to demonstrate that megakaryocytes are changed such that they are uh, able to fuel the fire and, have, uh, and, and drive malignancy. To prove that, Harvey actually did uh, invasion assays where he took the platelet releasate from these platelets from the PYMT mice and demonstrated that here you can see it's basically you have a two-chamber two system. Um, you put the tumor cells in and they're incubated with the platelets and then you want to see what happens. Do they invade? Do the tumor cells invade? And here you can see that by 24 hours the the uh, platelets that for coming from the PYMT mice actually caused the tumor cells to invade more than the platelets that were coming from the wild type mouse. And here is to show you what happens at, over time and, and at 24 hours, demonstrating this increased invasive capacity of the tumor cells that from, were uh, incubated with platelets from the tumor bearing animals. Next. Harvey wanted to see if the platelets from the PYMT mice actually promoted tumor cell colonization. And so what Harvey did was that he took the platelets and he isolated them from the wild type mouse or the PYMT mouse. And now he used models that we have that are mice with, that are thrombocytopenic. So these are uh, the thrombopoietin receptor is the MPL receptor. And these mice, they're knocked out for the MPL receptor. So they have very, very low platelets counts. And he took those tumors, took the, the platelets that ha came from either the wild type or the PYMT mouse, and he injected them into these mice with very low circulating platelet time counts, but at the same time he also injected labeled tumor cells. Then we took the lungs of the mice and used flow to count how many tumor cells did we see in the lungs of the mice that had been injected with uh, the, uh, the tumor cells with either platelets from the wild type or from the PYMT tumor bearing mouse and demonstrated in this experimental metastasis model that the PYMT donation of platelets actually caused more metastatic sites and more colonization than the, the platelets from the wild type mouse. So platelets derived from mice with breast cancer promote metastasis. We then went back to our patient samples to say, well, we saw that inflammatory markers were up. We knew from our early work with uh, Wendy Chen and the DOD project demonstrating that CCL5 and IL-8 could be up in breast cancer patients, but now we had this new player. We had S100, A8, and A9, and we wanted to see could we also see uh, an increase in, the, in those in S100, A8, and 9 in our breast cancer patients. Now, this work was actually done in the height of the pandemic when it was really hard to get patient samples. So I will tell you that this is an ongoing study and that we need to increase uh, the number of patients because we have very small ends here and we actually want to also do this where we stratify across the different stages of cancer. But I still will share with you the fact that there appears to be a trend towards significance of, up, of higher level of S100, A8, and 9 in the uh, patient's platelets in comparison to platelets from patients without cancer. And as a marker to demonstrate that there was a, a increased platelet activation, we looked at PF4 in the plasma and demonstrated that there was more PF4 in the plasma from breast cancer patients as opposed to the cancer-free patient. So taking us back a little bit in time, back to the, back to the uh, 2016, um, a work with Dr. Kelly Macklis and I had demonstrated that actually the activated platelet release aid could drive the megakaryocytes to produce platelets. So platelets could actually self-regulate. And if we think about that initial story that I told you about, that in cancer you actually have a thrombocytosis and these high platelet counts are associated with a worse outcome, we next wanted to little, understand a little bit about, well, what was going on in the megakaryocytes and in those animals that Harvey had been looking at the megakaryocytes to, and found all these inflammatory markers, were there any changes in our platelet counts and in our, uh, in our cells? And here, 
these, this is 13 weeks out. We had to sacrifice the mice because of the heavy tumor burden, but we started to see that there was a beginning of a separation with the, with the red being the, the cancer mice, demonstrating that there was a trend, starting to have a trend towards an, uh, a significance in the uh, platelet count. But what was even more surprising was the fact that there appeared to be an upregulation of platelet production as demonstrated by a higher immature platelet fraction. Think about this as like a reticulocyte count for your red cells. Um, and the mean platelet volume, which is a marker of platelet turnover, was actually also significantly higher in the PYMT cancer uh, cancer carrying mice. And so for this reason, we started to think about were well, there actually increase in platelet production where we seeing more young platelets. Young platelets are actually termed reticulated platelets and these platelets are usually bigger, they have more RNA in them, uh, and they can be hyperactivated. Um, and so we used a, a thiazole orange to look at RNA in the platelets and demonstrated that in the PYMT animals there were, there were a, a, a population of what looks like reticulated platelets or immature platelets. So we are now become very interested in understanding what's the role of different types of subpopulations of platelets. We can think about it as the young platelets or these early reticulated platelets. They don't usually survive that long in circulation, but there's other populations of platelets such as the procoagulant platelet. And we want to now start to understand, and this is where our research is going now, what is the role of these different subpopulations in the interaction of tumor cells? And is, there, is it just all comers of platelets or is there a particular particular type of platelet uh, that actually is more likely to interact with tumor cells. And from the patient world, I would say that there are a number of studies demonstrating that in cancer you actually can have a, an increased um, level of activation. So if you were to look at P-selectin, you'll actually see that patients with cancer have higher levels of P-selectin on the platelet surface. And we did a study with Dr. Gobriel in the myeloma patients and looking at AMGUS, which is a precursor for myeloma, smoldering myeloma, and then myeloma, and demonstrated that those patients with smoldering myeloma or myeloma actually had higher levels of baseline activation. And so we now want to move on to look at are there subpopulations, and what, and what does this uh, activated platelet population, are those the platelets that are more likely to interact with tumor cells? So, today I have shown you a, a data to demonstrate that tumor cells use platelets for immunoevasion, that platelets upregulate PDL1 on the tumor cell surface, that antiplatelet agents can interfere with platelet and tumor cell interactions, and I would say that we still, the jury is still out. We still don't know whether or not there is a role for using antiplatelet agents as uh, to augment current uh, methods for, for uh, regimens for treating malignancy. Platelets alter megakaryocyte maturation and platelet production through immune mediators, and cancer reprograms megakaryocytes to fuel the fire, increasing platelet production and pro-metastatic inflammatory profile of platelets. And with that, I'd like to thank my lab. Uh, the work that I shared with you was uh, done by Dr. Raweth, Mike Malloy, and Dr. Guo. Uh, I have a number of collaborators over at Ch Children's Hospital who have actually also been very helpful. And of course, I have to thank the Dana-Farber uh, and my uh, breast cancer doctors who work with me and the patients who provided samples to us for our studies. So thank you very much. I think there's a question at the back, one of our. Thank you. Oh. Uh, hello. Hey. Uh, great talk. It's uh, really interesting work to see you have. I'm Colton from Christian Castrop's group. Uh, I wanted to uh, know uh, you're talking a lot about platelet release state and how different uh, kind of protein signals and modulators there really affect. Uh, the cancer cells. Do you know of any cases where there's uh, nucleic acids or RNAs that are transferred from platelets into these yeah. cancers that really affect uh, uh, those kinds of outcomes? Yes, there's actually a whole literature on that. It's, um, the Wordinger group has actually looked at uh, the fact that you can use platelets and look for RNA from cancer cells. And so I would direct you to a series in blood hmm. when it, was it 2021 uh, that looked at the idea of tumor educated platelets. So, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
Sorry about that. I'm, I'm referring more mainly to the other way where you have RNA from the platelets oh. that are transferred into different cancer cells. No, uh, so th that's interesting. So no one has done that. But if you look at the CTC literature, the circulating tumor cell literature, there actually is work from Haber that looked at this idea of the platelets coding the tumor cells. And then he looked at the CTCs and looked at what the, the RNA content of those CTCs were. And actually, some of the top hits were actually platelet and coagulation genes. So it's not been done formally, but yes, probably we would find platelet RNA in the tumor cells. Great talk, Beth. Um, so okay. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> you saw I have more of a. Uh, Editorial question for you or a comment. So, uh, thrombopotent memetics have made it yeah. into the clinic yeah. for management Ch of chemotherapy induced thrombocytopenia with no endpoint actually being, um, how do I put this gently, anything that's relevant, right? They just, so you can raise the platelet count and give more chemo. And I'm a little bit fearful we're kind of doing the same thing, repeating things all over again in terms of the erythropoietin stimulating yeah. agents in terms of their use in cancer. So, you know, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yes, that's a, a wonderful question. And yes, thank you. Um, I am worried about that. Um, and you're right, no one has looked at that data. Um, you know, what if, yes, these patients are actually experiencing, they have chemo, that's why they're given the TPO mimetic, because their platelet count went too low, and we want to keep them on their therapy. So now, we actually give them TPO mimetic, and their platelet count rebounds. I think there's two ways to ask that question. Is it safe? That's the first question. What's happening in those platelets? Um, and what's happening to them in terms of their lifespan, right, if that's the case. But are we, is there a way that we could actually use this advantageously and say there's a reason not to overshoot, right? So maybe if we keep platelet counts into a decent range as opposed to getting a high platelet count, would we even see a difference? So could we use, so there's two questions there. Is it okay to do it? And two, is there a safer way to do it? Um, and so, yes, I actually am writing a grant to do that. <laughs> so, but it's a great question. Uh, just a question here. Um, breast cancer, would it metastasize this beyond lymphatics? It tends to metastasize to bone and lung, yeah. which is two places where megakaryocytes reside. I think the two main places. Do you think that's a coincidence or do you think there's potential correlation there? So I, I can tell you that in... So we, we, okay, I'll, let's see, I, I don't know, but I would tell you that uh, in, a stu in the study that we did with myeloma, the reason we started doing that study was actually to look at whether the myeloma cells were being reprogrammed by the megakaryocytes. And um, so I will tell you that we actually didn't see any differences in the myeloma studies, but breast and prostate, things that kind of go towards that, that's an interesting question. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we can think about that uh, in the future, but, I, yeah, I wouldn't know at this point, but I do think that we know the things that are getting released in the circulation are impacting those megakaryocytes, so if there are tumor cells there, that's certainly going to be interacting. So, you know, those, when, the, when they do metastasize to the bone, it's certainly those megakaryocytes and the tumor cells would have more of a chance to interact. Um, hi, um, really nice talk. Um, I, I'm going to refer to your initial few slides where you talked about CCR5 yeah. being involved in the crosstalk, but the first thing when it comes to CCR5 in my mind is I know a, pop, a certain percentage of the yes. population is mutated so right. for the HIV resistance. Right. So because you were talking about patient samples being low enough, did you ever con like Go. consider the CCR5 mutation probably hampering your p-value right. in your samples? Right. No, that's an excellent point, and, and we, we don't have that data, but that's an excellent point. Yes. I just have one more. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, one more question is, um, how do you think, because the, just um, anatomically speaking, breast cancer ha and just, um, and the mega, mega karyocytes maybe in the bone marrow, they're so distantly located, how do you think the breast cancer tissue is probably causing the mega karyocytes to be 
changing and uh, I, I think it's that the platelets and the tumor cells that are, it's, it's it's what's getting released systemically so i think the ccl5 or the um the the s108 and 9 is actually in circulation and it's then it's not that the tumor cell or the breast cancer tissue is in there especially in early stage disease where we also saw higher levels of s108 and 9 i right, thank you uh, hello. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. I'm Mahmoud from Ed Prisdar's lab, UBC. Uh, uh, I was wondering, like you showed that asp aspirin can uh, can uh, impact the int uh, interleukin-8 uh, uh, and the CCR expression. I was wondering, like uh, how the aspirin can impact the metastasis. Have you proven that uh, uh, the aspirin can uh, impact the metastasis of the tumor cells directly, or like does? Uh, the aspirin can be used to enhance the, the chemotherapy or something. Yeah, yeah okay. so um, we, what we think is that, it, it, that, that aspirin can do this, and aspirin has many different ways that it works, right? It's anti-inflammatory. So what I'm about to say about, relates just to the platelet properties of, of aspirin, but aspirin you know, impacts many different physiological things. So uh, we think that aspirin actually blocks the release of CCL5 and other growth factors and other chemokines from platelets. So the platelets can't release that the CCL5 or S108 and 9, which is then used to reprogram the tumor cells. So that is one mechanism. But like I said, you know, aspirin works many different ways. And two, whether or not the, the, the clinical utility of that pathway is still really in question because studies demonstrated that actually aspirin may not be the drug of choice in cancer. So I just want to put that out there. So really great talk. Um, I'm wondering, you mentioned P-selectin kind of very briefly, and I think you were looking at soluble P-selectin. Yeah. But I'm wondering, because you mentioned that platelets kind of immunocamouflage some of these tumors in the blood, right? Could, could the P-selectin from the platelets also be helping them metastasize, like get through extra visate and set up shop? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. There have been papers that have shown that P-selectin and integrins in general can be really important for this. Um, so, yes. And so then to your point, we come back to some of the earlier talks today, Dr. Bray, and wonder if we should use the P-selectin blockade. Thank you.